today's VORI's webinar. Thank you for participating in our discussion this afternoon entitled, What is the GDPR and Why Should I Care? An Introduction to the EU's General Data Protection Regulation. Before we get started, please review your screen to be sure that you see the following items. The presentation slides on top and three pods below, one for downloadable program materials and attendance forms, one for related websites, and a private Q&A box. All pods can be accessed throughout the presentation without interruption to the program. We encourage you to click into these links and documents for additional insight. Please note that the participant phone lines will be muted throughout the duration of the presentation. We also ask that you mute your own phone line as well via the Mute My Phone button um, directly on your screen or on your phone. We hope to offer time for questions at the conclusion of the presentation. You may type your questions into the Q&A box throughout the presentation. And now for opening remarks and introductions, I would like to turn the call over to Marcel Duhamel, partner with Bori Sayer, Seymour & Pease. Hi, everyone. Hopefully you can all hear me. Um, thank you for joining us today. What we are going to be discussing is the GDPR, um, how it potentially applies to businesses operating within the United States but processing or controlling data that is collected from people within the EU. Um, just a couple of quick things first. A, a bit of housekeeping. Um, this is our typical disclaimer. Presentation is not intended as legal advice and should not be relied on as legal advice. In other words, if you do nothing other than take our, um, take our slides and rely on them, try to apply those slides to your um, particular situation without consulting um, either us or some other lawyer of your choice, um, and then something goes wrong, please don't sue us. Here's today's agenda. Um, I'm going to spend some time talking about the general requirements that the GDPR imposes. Jonathan is going to spend some time talking about to whom the GDPR applies and how the GDPR applies differently um, to different types of entities. And then Heather will be talking about specific operational impacts um, that you might expect uh, if the GDPR, in fact, applies to you. So let's get into it. Uh, the GDPR um, is a regulation. Um, it was approved by the European Parliament in uh, April of 2016. It replaces what used to be called the Data Protection Directive. What they say they want to do is harmonize data privacy across the EU and to update the prior directive, which had been issued in 1995. Enforcement does not begin until May 25 of 2018, but there's every reason to believe that as of that date, it in fact will be enforced. So what is it? Um, it is a fairly comprehensive regulation that is intended to protect personal data belonging to European Union residents. It's far more comprehensive than any single piece of uh, legislation or regulation we have in the United States. It defines personal data quite broadly. It is any data that is related to a natural person that can be used directly or indirectly to identify that person. So it includes the obvious, name, email address. Um, it also includes things like an IP address, a MAC address, social network posts, uploads of images, um, that sort of thing. There's also um, some personal data that we're going to call special. Um, this is data that reveals racial or ethnic origin, data that reveals any individual's political opinion, data that reveals individual's religious or philosophical beliefs, data that reveals trade union membership, also any kind of genetic data, any kind of biometric data, if it is for the purpose of uniquely identifying a person, any kind of health data, data about an individual's sex life or sexual orientation. And the reason this is important is because the GDPR imposes a blanket restriction on collecting or processing this kind of information unless you have the explicit consent of the data subject. And even then, um, it is possible that member states of the EU have outlawed processing this, this kind of information. So the GDPR has an exception to the exception. Um, you need to check the national law of um, the EU resident. 
And then the question is, what is processing? And the way they define processing in the GDPR is any operation or set of operations, whether automatic or not, that is performed on personal data. So that includes such things as collecting it in the first place, recording it, organizing it, storing it, transmitting it, or consulting it, or using it. So there's a set of general principles that the GDPR imposes on everyone who is going to process or use data of EU residents. Some of these, by the way, seem fairly straightforward. Um, and to some extent, it's common sense and a question of the golden rule, right? What would you want done with your personal data? You can summarize it this way. Tell people the truth about what you're doing with their data. Tell them that you're going to be using it and then don't use it differently than the way you've told them you're going to be using it. The way the GDPR spells out these principles, data has to be processed lawfully, it has to be processed fairly, and it has to be processed transparently. It has to be collected for a very specific, legitimate purpose that is made explicit to the consumer, and it must not be further processed in a manner that's incompatible with the way you've already told them you're going to be using their data. The data has to be adequate to the purpose for which you are collecting it. It has to be relevant for that purpose. And it also has to be limited to what's necessary for that purpose. Finally, the data needs to be accurate and it needs to be up to date. You also have to keep it in a form that permits identification for no longer than is necessary for the purpose. In other words, if you tell people you're collecting their data uh, for some purpose, you cannot keep it forever. Once you no longer need the data for the reason you collected it, you have to get rid of it. And finally, it has to be processed in a manner that ensures appropriate security. So data is lawfully processed only if one of the following applies. The one that will usually apply is the individual consent of the EU resident. In addition, if it is necessary to perform or to enter a contract with an individual, if it's necessary to comply with a legal obligation, and this one, the last one, is one that you're unlikely to deal with very frequently, if it's necessary to protect the vital interests of the data subject or a third party. Also, if it's necessary to perform tasks carried out in the public interest or in the exercise of official authority, typically this applies more to governments than it would to individual businesses. And if it's necessary for the controller's legitimate interests, except where those interests are overridden by the interests, rights, or freedoms of the individual. So what is consent? Under the GDPR, um, consent has to be freely given it has to be specific, it has to be informed, and it must be unambiguous. Finally, it has to be signaled by a clear, unambiguous, affirmative um, consent. In other words, you cannot use a pre-checked box. You can't use um, you know, a, 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 an opt-out where the individual is presumed to have consented because they're on your website. Um, they have to affirmatively state that they want you to process their information. In order to do that, they need to know what you are processing and what you're intending to do with it. A great deal of the way the GDPR is organized, it's organized into articles, um, has to do with the rights of the individual from whom you are collecting information. The first of those rights is the right to be informed. This means that at the time you are collecting information directly from the individual, or if you are collecting the information from a third party within 30 days of the time you get that information from the third party, you have to inform the data subject of his or her rights. You have to tell them um, what you are doing with their information. This is definitely different than a lot of what happens in the United States. Um, the data subject has got the right um, to, to receive from you whatever data you are processing about them. They also have what is frequently referred to as the right to be forgotten, rectification and erasure. 
What this means is that, first of all, if, they, if the data subject discovers that there is some error or believes that there is some error in the data you have about them, they have the right to ask you to correct that error, and you have an obligation to do so. And they have the right to ask you to erase their data. Now, that right is not absolute. It depends on why you've collected their data in the first place um, and, and some other things. But in general, individuals have a, have a right to withdraw consent to processing at any time. And when they do so, typically, the processor or the controller has an obligation to acknowledge that right and to erase the data. They also have the right to restrict processing. In other words, um, you collected their data. They don't want it erased. They object to erasing it. But nonetheless, um, they want you to stop using it. Um, under those circumstances, typically, um, the data processor or controller must keep the data but also must stop using it. EU subjects have a right to data portability. This means that they can ask you to give them their data. And if you do so, you have to provide it in a structured, commonly used, machine-readable format. They can also ask that you send it directly to another controller. Data subjects have the right to object to what you're doing with their data. And this is an interesting one, and it's frankly somewhat similar um, to a consumer's right under the Fair Credit Reporting Act in the United States to be informed of adverse decisions that are being made with respect to them, although it's not identical, and I don't mean to suggest it is. Um, EU subjects have the right not to be subject to a decision that's based solely on automated processing. Now, that right is somewhat limited. But what it generally means is that the controller of data has to give the individual the right to some form of human intervention so that, at minimum, the data subject can contest the decision that's been made and register an objection to the decision that's been made. The GDPR also requires that once you have data, you treat it in a secure fashion. They set out specific safeguards um, that should ensure that the default is that only the personal data that's necessary for the specific purpose of processing it is actually processed. So there are factors that um, any data controller or processor should consider here. Uh, the amount of personal data that's being collected, um, the extent to which personal data um, is being processed, how long it's being kept, and what are the access controls around that data. Controllers and processors, um, and, and again, Jonathan will explain the difference between the two, um, are required to implement appropriate technical and organizational measures. That's how the GDPR puts it. Taking into account the state of the art and cost of implementation and the nature of the processing and risks presented. Unfortunately, um, as is the case with many rules in the United States, the GDPR doesn't give us a great deal of guidance as to exactly what an appropriate technical and organizational measure is. It doesn't tell us what the state of the art is. And it doesn't tell us exactly how we're supposed to balance the state of the art and the cost of implementation. Um, instead, it simply tells us that we're supposed to do these things. And we don't have a great deal of guidance yet um, from the EU as to how that's going to get applied. There are some suggestions, though. Um, for instance, they suggest pseudonymization um, and encryption of personal data. Um, they, they tell us that they would like us to ensure the ongoing confidentiality, integrity, availability, and resilience of processing systems and services. They want to make sure that you can restore availability and access um, in a timely manner. That's usually in the event of some sort of system failure and that there should be a process for testing on a regular basis uh, the effectiveness of uh, security measures that you have implemented, whether they are organizational measures, things that control access, for instance, on a policy basis, or technical measures. There's also a requirement for breach notification. And this requirement is a little bit onerous, some might, some might say, because it requires notice of certain types of data breaches 
within 72 hours, um, the way they put it, without undue delay and where feasible, not later than 72 hours after the discovery um, of, the, of the data breach. And if you take longer than that, you have to have a reasonable justification for the delay. A personal data breach um, is defined as a breach of security leading to the accidental or unlawful destruction, loss, alteration, or disclosure of or access to personal data. And what's interesting is that it's not merely the disclosure to third parties, but the, the destruction or loss of the data can also trigger the need um, to notify EU residents. Notice is required, or I'm sorry, notice is not required where the breach is unlikely to result in a risk to the rights and freedoms of natural persons. What we don't have from the GDPR is a great deal of guidance on what that means. When is a risk, um, when is a breach likely or unlikely to result in a risk to the rights and freedoms of natural persons? I suspect that in most situations we'll find that the controller or processor um, who lost the information will have a different view of that than the uh, individual whose information has been lost. So I would anticipate that there will be um, disputes about that in the future. When you do notify, you have to notify the, um, the DPA. The DPA is the relevant authority within the EU, depending on the member state who's got enforcement authority over the GDPR. You have to tell that person uh, the nature of the breach, including um, the number of people whose rights uh, may have been affected. You have to give them the data protection officer's contact information. We'll talk about a DPO in a little bit. You have to describe the likely consequences of the personal data breach. And you have to explain how you uh, propose to address the breach, including anything you intend to do to mitigate it. What we recommend at a minimum is that companies update their incident response plans to include these requirements um, and update their training. Because these requirements are somewhat different than the notification requirements in the United States, which also vary um, state by state. The GDPR requires that some types of entities appoint a data protection officer. Jonathan will talk about who is required to do that, but in general, if you are required to do it, um, the data protection officer's job is to ensure the entity's compliance with the GDPR. That person has to be qualified. It's not clear exactly what the qualifications have to be. And that person has to report directly to senior management. They will interface, liaison, if you prefer that, with government officials. There are three specific situations where a DPO is required. You have to have a DPO um, if the processing is being carried out by a public authority or body. That probably applies to none of you on the phone. You have to have a DPO if the core activities of the controller or the processor consist of processing operations, which require regular and systematic monitoring of data subjects on a large scale, or where the core activities consist of processing on a large scale the special categories of data um, or personal data relating to criminal convictions and offenses. When I say special categories, those were the special categories that I discussed earlier, things like genetic information, health information. Um, so the, the, the trick here is, what does it mean for your core activity to consist of processing operations? And what does it mean for those operations to require regular and systematic monitoring of data subjects on a large scale? There's not a lot of guidance on this. Uh, the, the, the examples that are given are, frankly, on such opposite ends of the continuum that it's very difficult to understand where the EU thinks the middle is. Right? So on the one hand, if you are a massive operation that is collecting data on hundreds of thousands of EU residents every day, say it's health insurance data or something like that, then certainly you need a DPO. On the other hand, if you are an American business who only occasionally has data belonging to an EU resident. And when I say only occasionally, I mean truly um, one-off data. 
um, then it's very clear that you don't need a DPO. Where, where it's unclear is what's in the middle. What's, what's enough uh, to require a DPO? And I'm sad to say that we just don't have a lot of guidance on that yet. So it's going to have to be, for the time being, a reasonableness test. But we don't know how um, individual uh, member states are going to interpret that requirement. Um, with one exception, we do know how the state, uh, how Germany is going to in interpret that. Germany um, requires that if you have any EU data of a member state, I'm sorry, if you have any EU data, any data of a German citizen, if you process, taking it literally even one German citizen's data, then you must have a DPO, and that DPO must be resident in Germany. There are some very substantial potential penalties. Um, first of all, there is a private right of action um, for people who suffer material or non-material damage. I'm not exactly sure what non-material damage is, um, but, there, <laughs> but nonetheless, EU citizens have a right to sue. Um, what they are able to get is their actual damages that they can prove. That would include things like pain and suffering, and they can bring collective claims. Perhaps scarier, uh, there are fines that can be imposed, and those fines can range up to the greater of 20 million euros or 4% of annual global turnover. Now, that is supposed to be um, reserved for the most egregious violations, and it's supposed to be tiered, so it should typically not be the case that out of the blue, some entity gets fined to that extent without having had some pre knowledge that it was running into trouble. But again, the fact is, we just don't have a lot of guidance as to how EU member states are going to interpret this. I leave it to, um, to all of you on the phone to assess this question. Um, might there be um, political reasons for a member state to seek out a large American company for a fine? Um, there might be, there might not be, um, but there could be very strong reasons for American companies to want to avoid being in a position where they offer some EU data protection authority the opportunity to do that. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Jonathan. Thank you, Marcel. So as Marcel was, uh, gave a great background of, of kind of the requirements of the GDPR, I'm going to be talking about uh, who is subject to it. So um, we're going to start off by talking about who is subject to the GDPR. We're going to uh, discuss the concepts of a controller and processor. And then I'm going to give you some examples. So when we talk about the GDPRs, uh, uh, who's subject to it, obviously if you have a physical presence in the EU, the GDPR would apply. Uh, we get a lot of questions from clients uh, who talk about, well, I don't really have a physical presence in the EU. Um, you know, does the GDPR apply to, to me? And it, it really depends. So uh, the GDPR applies to the processing of personal data of data subjects who are located in the EU by a controller or processor. And we'll talk about the definition of controller or processor. Uh, even if those are not established in the EU, where the processing activities are related to, if you offer goods or services, irrespective of whether a payment of the subject of the data subject is required to such data subjects in the EU or monitoring their behavior as far as their behavior takes place within the EU. So this really applies to you know uh, uh, online commerce uh, or if you have some type of, of website that has a lot of EU resident uh, uh, members or users of of of, of, of a website. So. Uh, as I said, it, it really depends. So even if you don't have a physical presence or any employees in the EU, the GDPR may apply to you. So um, one of the other questions we get is, what is in that, that definition of applicability, what does monitoring their behavior mean? And so this includes tracking EU individuals on the Internet, potential, uh, including potential subsequent use of personal data, which consists of profiling a person, particularly in order to make decisions regarding that person or analyze or predict their preferences or behaviors. So think about cookies, think about, um, you know, uh, if, you, if you're getting uh, browsing history, those types of things. So the, the next uh, kind of definitions uh, 
that I'm going to talk about is the, the difference between a controller and a processor. So the, the uh, GDPR defines a controller as a natural or legal person, public authority, agency, or other body which alone or jointly with others determines the purposes and means of the processing of personal data where the purposes and means of such processing are determined by uh, the EU or a member state law, the controller or the specific criteria for its nomination may be provided for by the union or member state law. So that says a lot to, to basically say this. So you are a controller if you determine how uh, you're going to process personal data, whether or not you, you are the person actually processing the data or you have outsourced that to a third party. So we get a lot of questions about, well, you know, I have uh, EU presence, but, uh, you know, we're not going to process the data. We're going to have a third party process it, so should the GDPR apply to me? And uh, it would because you are defined as a controller. So um, the other a topic or definition that we're going to talk about is the processor. And this is pretty much, this is an easier uh, a thing for people to understand. Basically, it, it's any entity that processes personal uh, data on behalf of a controller. So examples include payroll processors, third-party administrators for benefits, uh, if you have a CRM, customer relation management uh, software system, or if you contract with a third party to do website uh, or any type of data analytics, uh, they would be considered a processor under the GDPR. So we have some examples of uh, whether or not uh, uh, someone would be subject to GDPR. And the first example is a U.S.-based entity with U.S.-based HR and payroll processing, but employs individuals who ri reside in the EU. The question is, are they subject to the GDPR? And uh, the answer is yes, the GDPR applies. The second example I have is a U.S.-based website hosting, uh, hosting provider with a large number of customers located in the EU. EU. The provider does not have a physical presence in the EU. Once again, does the GDPR apply? And it does. Now, the one thing we get a lot of questions about, about whether or not we're subject to the GDPR is, uh, uh, well, someone will say, well, you know, I have a, a website and we have uh, EU cust or data on EU subjects. Um, you know, should I, do I really have to apply, you know, do I really have to mess with all this stuff from the EU? Because, you know, if, if the European Commission or any of the member states try to go after me, I'm not physically located in the EU and I don't have any assets in the EU and, you know, really is there, you know, can they, can they enforce a judgment in the U.S. against me for violations of the GDPR? And the, the comment I always give back to individuals who say that is, um, well, you know, it's, it's untested. So, and, and I always tell people, you know, you don't want to be the first test case to see if, you know, uh, uh, a judgment can be enforced, a GDPR judgment can be enforced in U.S. courts even if you don't have a physical presence or any assets in the EU. So, um, you know, I, I would hate to be the first person to have that, that test case, and uh, we always suggest that clients don't try to avoid compliance by, uh, you know, thinking that since they don't, they don't have any contact with the EU, they, nothing, you know, nothing bad will happen. So I'm going to turn it over to Heather to talk about uh, kind of top impacts uh, for the GDPR and uh, what what you need to think about in your business uh, when you're when you're thinking about this and implementing it. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So the first top impact that we're seeing with, uh, with lots of folks on the GDPR going into into place here or coming into force, I should say, is making sure reviewing all the, the basis is for how you're processing EU personal data. Uh, you know, you, there, there are specific reasons why you're allowed to process under the GDPR, um, particularly one that's heavily relied on typically or, or will be is consent. So a big change here uh, from the current state direct, uh, the EU directive and, and the similar implementing laws across the EU, many of them allowed, in, you know, pre-checked boxes, implicit consent, um, but that is expressly no longer valid. Uh, it, 
it cannot be any sort of activity. It has to be an affirmative action um, that the person takes to give you this consent. Um, so we've been talking, think about you know, how have you gotten consent in the current state from EU residents? Um, has it always been opt-in? Has it been affirmative? Have you maybe gotten consent from free check boxes, for example? And consider whether before the GDPR comes into, into force, whether you want to recontact people and you know, have them now give affirmative consent before the GDPR comes into force um, so that you're clear on that point on May 25th. You also need to make sure that EU customers opt in to things like marketing um, on a going forward basis once it comes into, comes into force. And um, you're going to have to make sure you implement it across all your channels. So if it's online, calling into call centers, you know, when they're placing orders, um, on mobile devices, however you're getting it, make sure it's implemented across channels. And you'll also have to make sure when you're asking for consent that you're meeting the consent and transparency standards. The Article 29 Working Party, which is a collection of the data protection authorities in the EU, have issued some recent draft guidance on what it means to obtain consent and how what how transparent your communications need to be. And the draft guidance uh, emphasizes you know, clear, concise, direct communication, not vagueness. It, if they think there's any sort of vagueness, they're going to say the consent is invalid or they didn't consent to that purpose. And you need to make sure that your consent covers every possible purpose that you want to use that data for if you don't have some other lawful basis for processing. So, you know, consent, it, it can't be just this vague, you know, I consent to let you use my data for any purpose that you want. <laughs> um, or for marketing purposes, it really has to be, you know, I consent to marketing about your products and services. It has to be specific to the company. Um, you know, sometimes in our, our privacy policies in the U.S., if we don't say something, then we can do it. <laughs> um, it's very opposite in the EU. You have to say it. And you have to have consent or some other lawful basis um, in order to do it. So that is a bit of a change in how we think about that. So and next, the top impact here is considering the individual rights that Marcel discussed. If you are a data controller, Many of these rights exist currently, such as the access and correction rights under the directive. Uh, maybe the company wasn't subject to the directive and it's implementing laws because currently we don't have the extraterritorial ter reach like the GDPR is, is seeking to implement. Um, so, you may, so even though some of these rights existed, maybe you haven't had to implement them before, or maybe you do already have these processes and procedures in place, but now they, you have to be able to respond to these requests uh, within 30 days, and there's limited uh, reasons that you can extend that timeline. So really, as an organization, reviewing your processes and procedures, do you have the processes and procedures in place to respond to these types of quest, requests? Um, are you review the exceptions for when you don't have to honor the request, such as uh, if it's EU resident requests data to be deleted, but you need it for legal purposes. Um, you know, there's a specific statutory requirement, let's say, to hold on to customer records for uh, five years or something. You know, you don't. Their their right of deletion is not absolute. There are reasons um, why you don't have to do it, but you do need to communicate your response to them. So, again, reviewing your processes and procedures to make sure you have this in place, knowing what the exceptions are. Um, reviewing you know, your, your base, whether you qualify for that exception in each instance, um, so that you're not trying to manage all of this within 30 days if you get a request in from an EU resident. And again, now these rights only apply to data controllers, so if you're thinking you're just a limited data processor um, under the GDPR, you may not need to implement these. But if you are a processor and you're, maybe you're managing these processes for a controller, you, know, you need to make sure you're working well within the organization and who you're doing this, doing this for. Another top impact that we're seeing as a result of the GDPR is making sure you and your organization know your data, knowing how and where you store your personal data. Um, you need to know that because if, you know, for example, if an EU resident does make a request and they want to update their data or they want to know how you're, they're sharing your data or they want to take it all with them, you need to know what all you have 
and where it is so that you can make sure that you can be responsive to those requests and honor those requests as required under the GDPR. So can you change it? Can you provide it? Um, can you tell who's accessed it? Can you tell who you're sharing it with? Um, can you tell for what reasons? Uh, a helpful tool here that the um, GDPR and the Article 29 Working Party has issued guidance on is data mapping, um, which is an illustration of your organization where you record you know, what everything you have, where it is, what policies and procedures govern it, who has access to it, what vendors have access to it. Um, and so that you, you take an assessment of all that, and it can be can, can look you know, like this, or it can look like what makes sense for your organization. Um, and then not only making sure you do that at the outset as the GDPR comes into force, but then making sure you have a regular process in place to make sure that it's updated anytime you get a new type of data, um, when there's a proposed new use of the data, a new access request to the data uh, by a vendor, for example, maybe a new vendor needs access to the data. So making sure not only that you do it once and have a good grasp of what you have and where it is and where the risks are, but then also making sure that you continue to keep that map updated so that your organization can constantly review and, and make sure you're keeping up with your obligations. So also, you know, making sure that you have an appropriate cybersecurity program and data security program in place, also business continuity recovery, all of that's touched on by the GDPR, as Marcel talked about. Um, you know, also reviewing your vendor access. Do they need access to all this data? Sometimes, you know, you know we'll get clients, things like, yeah, you know, of course the vendor needs access to everything, and then um, you're like, wait, do they, you know, this is a marketing person. Do they really need access to, you know, employee social security numbers? <laughs> um, and, so, you, you know, there's some pushback. So reviewing before it comes into force with all this in mind, do the vendors need access to all this data? Are there ways to limit their access to their data? Um, is it really a good thing for them to maybe have you know, default that they can access all types of, of personal data? And then also making sure that they, if they are accessing your per personal data, they're acting as a processor for you or service provider, of, of including of EU personal data, that they also have appropriate safeguards in place uh, for your data to make sure that it's protected. And finally, this helps you reveal where are your gaps. You know, is there this huge bucket of data that people have access to that they maybe don't need? Um, do you, you know, is there a big bucket where you're not sure if you have appropriate consent to use it in the way that is outlined in the data map? Um, is there, uh, you know, some gaps in the policies and procedures in terms of governance and protecting the data? So data mapping is a very effective tool in conducting a, a risk assessment and impact assessment is what it's called under the GDPR. To understand truly where your risks are and how you can improve uh, is a very helpful exercise and it is something that the GDPR envisions in the Article 29 working part of the DPAs that will be an ongoing task. So the next impact that we get a lot of questions about and is causing consternation, Marcel alluded to earlier, is the data protection officer requirement, um, as he stated. It, is, it does seem pretty broad, and there's <laughs> not a lot of guidance as to um, in the middle, right, what, you know, where you are between if you really do need to uh, appoint a data protection officer. And so the Article 29 party has issued some guidance. Um, as Marcel said, you have the, the main case that likely that you're to fall into if, if you're subject to it is you know, where you have to appoint a DPO where you, the core activities of the controller or the processor consist of prophecy, processing operations which require regular and systematic monitoring of data subjects on a large scale. And, and so that's really what we're concerned about. And the Article 29 Working Party has issued a little bit more guidance on what core, acti core activities are. They are key operations necessary to achieve your business purpose. Um, and that's inextricably linked. So, you know, if you're a healthcare organization providing healthcare, you know, uh, data records, um, anything that's core to that is going to be considered a core activity. Um, it, and again, not super helpful, but a little bit more guidance. Um, they have said they do not include ancillary services. So, 
you know, uh, HR payroll. Um, that is not a core activity unless you're, a, you know, an HR payroll company, for example. But for most, if that's not your core business, that's an ancillary service or IT support for your internal network, um, HR activities, paying employees, those sorts of things. Now it's unclear uh, whether it, they really don't say anything about marketing, uh, so it's unclear whether that would be considered a core or ancillary. You can see arguments both sides. On the one hand, you know it is core to your business to grow your business and for you to sell your products and services, you, you do need to engage in some sort of marketing. Um, and, you know, at the same time, it, you could argue that it's ancillary because every organization has to do it, and that you know it's just it's not really your core business. It's just it's how you sell. So we'll see if there's more guidance in that regard. Regard, but so if it you know so if it does if it is a core activity, and then it has to occur on a large scale. So the article. Or, 29 Working Party has said, you know, there's no magic number in terms of what's large and what's not. So factors that they're going to think about, it's going to be a balancing test, is the number of EU data subjects involved, uh, the volume of the data, is it, you know, a, a lot of data, a minimal amount of data, the duration um, or the perman permanence of the processing activity, if you're only processing it for a short while. That would be a factor that you know, maybe you don't qualify for uh, the data protection officer requirement, and also the geographical extent of the processing activity. Now, recently, the European Commission has launched a website, I guess just about two weeks ago, about uh, GDPR and has offered more guidance. So they did release these examples of when a DPO is not mandatory under the GDPR. So the first example is the organization is a local community doctor that processes personal data of its patients. Second, or it, the organization is a small law firm and processes personal data of its clients. And I think these are helpful examples in, in some regard because clearly, uh, well, first of all, the, these both of these which are in envisioning that they're in the EU, so there is some sort of physical presence, <laughs> um, and they're not required to have a DPO. Plus. You know, they probably have a sizable amount of people. You know, a local doctor probably has, you know, several hundred, if not, you know, a thousand patients. Same thing with a small law firm. In both of these examples, the type of business that they're doing, they're likely to have pretty sensitive or that special personal data that Marcel was talking about. They're not just going to have um, just kind of like name and healthcare uh, info, or not just like your health insurance number. They're going to have you know, all the records of your diagnosis and, and everything that would be considered sensitive. So these are two examples where a DPO is not um, mandatory. So I do also think that, you know, if you're processing data, if you have maybe a handful of EU residents that are customers, I think these are helpful requirements that, illustrations that maybe a DPO, DPO isn't mandatory for you and that this doesn't qualify as a large scale. But the, the final prong or aspect of the DPO requirement um, is that you have to engage in regular and systematic monitoring of data subjects on a, on a large scale. So what does that mean? The Article 29 Working Party has given guidance that monitoring means tracking individuals on the internet plus the subsequent use of their personal data processing techniques that consist of profiling. Now, profiling means any form of automated processing of personal data to evaluate certain personal aspects related to a natural person, such as to analyze or predict their personal preferences, um, their interests, or behavior. Specific examples they've given of what qualifies as regular and systematic monitoring includes retargeting, data-driven marketing, marketing activities, behavioral advertising, and of course, um, many of us with websites engage in all sorts of these, you know, these activities all the time. Um, you know, retargeting on your website, and if you're doing any sort of cross-device tracking, um, using cookies to do behavioral advertising, uh, or or um, other technologies. All those types of technologies that is then used to predict, you know, what ads I might like, um, or how frequently I come back to the website. Um, where I might be looking to book my airfare, um, 
you know, all those great tools, the, the EU has staked out the position that that does constitute regular and systematic monitoring. So it's something to evaluate in the organization. If you are doing this, now maybe you only have a handful. It's maybe it's not on a large scale. Um, maybe you only have a handful of residents. You know, can you can you tell? Um, do you know? Are you doing IP address identification, for example? That you're tying it to the cookies so that you do know if they're in the EU. Um, what are you doing? So. Um, the, the GDPR does say that unless it's obvious that you're not required to designate a DPO, um, which so far with the guidance, they really haven't given a ton of examples that it's not obvious um, that you have to do an internal analysis and document you know, how you evaluated these factors and where you came out and keep that analysis available so that if there was any question communication with the Data Protection Authority, you would have that to share with them. So we do expect more guidance on this topic in particular to be forthcoming. They have stated that it doesn't, you can use you know, a service provider to be your data protection officer, for example. It doesn't have to be within the organization. Um, but there is an expectation that the DPO is independent um, and that your organization will follow their advice. <laughs> um, so if you go to the data protection officer, you know, you're, you're talking about development of a new product and the DPO gives you advice. Um, and then you don't follow it, that's going to look really bad. So, <laughs> um, you know, so these are all factors to consider about whether your organization is going to be subject to this requirement. Uh, the EU, the GDPR guidance, they seem to look for almost voluntary, like if you're on the border, since the, one of the goals of the GDPR is to harmonize data protection to make it more um, ingrained in your or in organizations, um, to make it more uh, fundamental, you know, they probably will lean of in favor of including a data protection officer, um, whether you're on the border or not. They definitely think it's a good thing and, and want companies to have it. So that is a potential for a lot of impact in, in evaluating that and determining your organization is going to do that and then how you're going to set up the policies and procedures to make sure the DPO can fulfill all the requirements of the GDPR. Another impact is incorporating privacy by design. Have they been included into your business practices? Now, many of you may have heard this concept before. This actually is not, not, not new. The Federal Trade Commission here in the US, and their privacy report that they released in 2012, also advocated for incorporating privacy by design. And they frequently come back to that topic now. So you know, has it, do you think about privacy at all stages? Do you, does it include your suppliers? Are they involved in the privacy? Do you, you know, limit? You make sure they only have the access to the data that they need, for example. Um, are you thinking about privacy when you develop new products and services? And do you have governance procedures in place to uh, incorporate these principles? So that may have a big impact as well. Uh, and that, another top impact is just, re re as Marcel said earlier, reviewing your data security, your cybersecurity programs, making sure that it meets the requirements of the GDPR. Um, and also looking at your incident response plans will be a challenge. You know, you have to understand whether you are subject to the, you are a data controller that would be subject to giving the 72-hour notice. Do you know which DPA is your primary one that you would be required to give the notice to? Um, and how quickly would you be able to do that to meet the 72-hour deadline? That's going to take some thought an evaluation on your organization's part. You don't want to be stuck with your first breach and try to figure out who you have to contact and how um, within 72 hours. Also thinking about your vendors and reviewing their obligations to notify you. If your vendor knows about it, sits on it for two days or three days, and then you, you know, lets you know, that's going to be challenging for you know, the DPA could say, well, you, you really should have known earlier. So thinking through all that process for your incident response plans. And in that, now that's for the data controller. If you're a processor, also reviewing yours to make sure you know who, what controllers you would need to notify without undue delay um, in the event of your breach. So the last topic, the impact that we're seeing is uh, dealing with cross-border data transfers. And this has been a, a very popular question. Now, if you want to, a lot of people have asked, well, hey, can I just transfer all the data over to the US and then I don't have to worry about the GDPR? <laughs> And the answer to that is no. <laughs> um, and now this is current state under the directive and current EU law. 
the U.S. is not considered an adequate privacy regime in the eyes of EU regulators. Never has been considered adequate. Some countries are, like Canada, Australia. U.S. is not. So in order, if you're subject to the directive currently and then now with the GDPR, you're subject to it. If you want to transfer personal data of EU residents over to the U.S., then you have to implement an adequate measure um, to make sure that the EU personal data um, is given the same protections here in the U.S. Uh, that it would be in the EU. So the current options right now are you can certify it to this privacy shield, you can implement standard contractual clauses, it's also called model contracts, or you can come up with binding corporate rules. The GDPR also contemplates that there could be codes of conduct or new certification developed that you would then be able to tra you know, transfer data pursuant to you know, your membership or your certification with an organization, but none of those have been approved yet, but that may be a future option. So quickly, the privacy shield, um, some of you may have heard the term safe harbor previously under the, the current EU state. The safe harbor, the privacy shield is similar to the safe harbor, it replaced it in 2016. In 2015, the safe harbor was deemed not adequate, not providing an adequate level of protection um, for EU personal data being transferred to the US. And so this new regime came up in August of 2016. In order to qualify for the privacy shield, you have to be subject to the FTC or Department of Transportation jurisdiction. You, there's a website, privacyshield.gov, that you can go and um, see the requirements, but it does have a self, it has a guide of how you self-certify to the privacy shield. So in a nutshell, you have to submit a privacy policy that complies with the privacy shield's principles. You have to state that you would adhere to the privacy. You also have to adopt an independent resource mechanism and explain to EU residents if they do want to complain you know, how they can make uh, use of that, that independent resource mechanism. Um, organizations such as the Council of Better Business Bureau Trustee, the American Arbitration Association, and the Direct Marketing Association have all developed programs to help assist with this recourse mechanism. Um, they can Alternatively, if you don't want to adopt an independent resource mechanism, you can choose to cooperate with EU data protection authorities. But that may bring in <laughs> challenges and risks in and of itself. Um, and then you also have to have procedures for verifying compliance. So what are the Privacy Shield principles? Well, they're very similar to what we've talked about with the GDPR, uh, some of the main uh, points. So making sure you provide people notice of opioid data practices, give them choice, give them white switch off consent, you know, accountability for onward transfer. This is, you know, your organization is committed under the privacy shield to obey, to, to provide an adequate level of protection for EU personal data. So making sure that your vendors, um, you know, are are also if they're gonna if you're gonna transfer your personal data of EU residents on to vendor onward to vendors that they also have these principles incorporated into place and that they are also providing an adequate level of protection. Um, data security, data integrity access, and of course the recourse um, enforcement so that if, if a EU resident is concerned about how you're using their data or how you're storing it that they have a recourse. Uh, just recently in October, it was the first annual review of the Privacy Shield, uh, whether it is adequate. Um, both the European Commission and the Article 29 Working Party did recommend that the Privacy Shield is currently providing an adequate level of data protection, uh, but they both found there was room for improvement. <laughs> um, a big thing was filling the Privacy Om Omnisbudsman and the members of the Civil Liberties Oversight Board, making sure those government folks get appointed. Um, there haven't even been many nominees yet for those positions. So they are concerned about that. Also, that the they're concerned that the Department of Commerce has not monitored compliance or taken any steps to um, prevent false claims of certification with the Privacy Shield. In September, the Federal Trade Commission actually did reach a settlement with three companies for falsely claiming that they were part of the Privacy Shield. So currently, about 2,400 companies are certified. Uh, Privacy Shield is, is often seen as a, a quicker way to, uh, a quicker way to implement so that you can transfer data to the U.S. The second option is standard contractual clauses, and again, these exist today. They're available um, from the EU website, the Europa website. Um, they have been approved by the EU. They are in use, and they have to be included in contracts between a data exporter and a data importer. 
and they have different standard clauses for controller to processor situations and controller to controller situations. They have to be used for every type of data processing, so making sure that your standard contractual clauses with your processor, for example, if this is the tool you're going to use, covers all the, the uh, processes and procedures and the ways that you may be using it and processing the data. And they have to be updated if there's a new, prop, a new purpose of data processing occurs. So here, just a quick picture of what they look like. Like I said, these are available, and there are uh, a couple different forms. And this usually can be done between companies, and this also can be a, quicker, a quick way. But you do have to make sure that you're following the obligations present in the contract, and you know, you're obeying your contractual obligations. Interestingly, the standard contractual clauses have now been challenged whether they are adequate anymore um, by the same guy, Shrem, some of you may have heard of him, who challenged the safe harbor. Um, so in October, the Irish High Court did refer the standard contractual clauses to the EU's Court of Justice to consider whether it's still an adequate mechanism. So we'll see where that goes. And the last option that currently exists is binding corporate rules. Um, these are legally binding internal rules that your organization adopts for, for your organization. Um, it can be adopted by either multinational groups or kind of groups, group enterprises engaged in joint economic activity. Um, they have to be customized for your organization layout, you know, your privacy principles, how you're going to protect the data, the purposes that you use it for. Um, they require approval by your supervising data protection authority. So you do have to go and present and explain um, to the data protection authority that why this makes sense for your organization and why these are and how these comply with GDPR and its principles. Um, this can, can be seen to be take longer than the other two options. Uh, it's coming out a quick process. Um, it can be helpful though because you can go to, especially if you're multinational dealing with other, you know, uh, Asian or other parts of the world, their uh, data privacy regimes, you can get multiple DPAs in other parts of the world to sign off as well. Now, they don't cover, trans, cover transfers outside of a corporate group, so this won't help you with your vendors. But if you're a large organization operating in many countries and transferring data, this can be a helpful tool as well. And so if you do want to start transferring data to the, EU, to the US or another non-adequate country, you will have to consider which of these you're going to adopt or look for a new method in the future. And so those are our top impacts. I know we're, we're getting close on time, but uh, Kayla, let's see if there's any questions. Yes, at this time we do welcome your questions. Please type your question into the private Q&A box directly on your screen. We do have a handful that are already in queue that our speakers can um, begin to answer. I do want to let you know that if we do not answer your question during our program today, we will follow up with you individually. So please do not worry if we do not get to your question. But, Please submit them through that box, and our speakers will begin to address them. So I do see one question here about um, whether the Working Party 29 has released proposed or model legal agreements for controllers to have with processors similar to business associate agreements ensuring the GDPR compliance, and that is the standard contractual clauses that are available. Um, you know, DPAs are reviewing those. Other countries may update them, but currently that is an effect. You can use those. You literally use the, the language that you need from them, um, and, and you can use that today. So that, yes, that does exist. Um, it's at the Europa.gov or Europa website, um, available in multiple languages, and that is a helpful tool. We have one question asking whether or not we think this is really just Y2K revisited. Um, you know, some, some of you may remember the uh, 1998, 1999, there was a lot of um, speculation about the so-called Y2K bug, and lots of companies spent a great deal of money trying to get themselves ready for what was supposed to be a catastrophe, and then nothing happened. Um, and I've certainly heard other, um, other folks ask if this is something along those same lines. And I think the answer is sort of no. Um, I think the EU is serious about the GDPR, and I think it is serious about at least trying to enforce it extraterritorially. The extent to which it's able to do so, as uh, Heather pointed out, remains to be seen. As Jonathan pointed out, remains to be seen. Um, but I don't think any of you on the phone want to be the test case where you are um, 
trying to defend against um, some uh, EU member states attempt to domesticate a big judgment against you. Having said that, I don't think that on May 26th, the day after this thing becomes effective, we're going to see um, 20, euro, 20 million euro fines being levied against American companies for noncompliance. I could be wrong, but um, I, don't, I don't think it's going to be that kind of catastrophe. I do see that it's 1 o'clock. Um, we're happy to stay on and answer a few more questions. I see there's some in the box. And if you want to keep submitting, you're welcome to. Um, but do want to acknowledge that the hour is up. So if you need to drop, feel free to drop. And if you can stay while we continue to talk through some of these questions, uh, please feel free to. Uh, one interesting question I see from Rick is, uh, what about a credit card token? Uh, so it's a value that represents the primary account number, but it's not actually the account number. It is used to track customer purchasing and determining sale trends. Would that be an example of monitoring? And that's a great question. And, and yes, you know, the, the way that the EU defines um, personal data is anything that identifies an individual. So even though a, a token is not um, your traditional sense of identifying a, a, an individual, um, it does, you can identify who it is, or you are tracking an individual basically based on that value. Um, so that sort of thing, you know, similar technology, that, that would likely be considered monitoring. All right. At this time, there are no more questions. Thank you to all of our speakers, and thank you for joining us today. Please be on the lookout for an evaluation email in your inbox within the next 24 hours, as well as attendance forms um, for those of you seeking credit. Should you have any questions after our call, please feel free to reach out to Marcel, Jonathan, or Heather. This concludes our program.